more room on today's show, we have Dr. John Diamond. Uh, we're still looking for Dr. Mike Spaulding. I, I did uh, call real quick Rapture Hotline to make sure that that hadn't happened yet and we got left behind or anything. <laughs> I'm, sure, uh, I'm sure that uh, ministry's got him off doing some things. John, the first time I really got to sit down and talk with you was last year at the Ohio conference that uh, uh, Mike Spaulding put on. And uh, we got over at, to Bob Evans, and it was you, Carl Gollops, Randy Conway, and myself, and we just got to talk and shop, and we had liberals running to the other side of the restaurant. <laughs> yes, we certainly did. They didn't. Li- they didn't like that cover. I forgot all about that. I'm glad you reminded me of that. Yeah, they they were running for the hills. Uh, and we're with some of what we're going to talk about today. Uh, uh, Dr. John has two books out. The first one is Appeal to Heaven, A Cry for Divine Justice. Uh, very, very timely. I think it's as timely now as it was when it was first published. And uh, believers, for some reason or another, when you start talking about judgment, they run for the hills, mm-hmm. which I, ha- I have never, John, I have never understood. Uh you know, if you're, if it, if it's under the blood, the Bible says the righteous rejoice in judgment. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I think one of the things that your book calls to uh, to our attention is because of whatever's going on in this dynamic uh, in the church, we're not crying out for justice. We're not crying out for judgment. And because of that is probably one of the major reasons we're in the mess that we're in. Yeah, that's certainly true. And again, it starts with the individual. So I, that that's what I found, I think, more than anything is, remember, Jesus talked about judge not lest you be judged. And he said, first, get the beam out of your own eye so you can see clearly to get the speck out of your brother's eye. So, I mean, it always has to happen with us first. So when we just open ourselves up and we're just like, here I am, you know, judge me, so to speak, whatever's in there, get it out. I want to be right with you. When we do that, then two things happen. One, we, we have the discernment. Um, the discernment to see, because that's what I mean. If you think about the eye, the eye is one of the only things that you try to touch somebody's eye. So you got to have discernment when you're trying to deal with somebody else or deal with their problems. Um, so you're not, you know, just going in there and poking their eyeball out. And uh, But when you do that, that's, that's what I find is other like-minded people who really kind of live that same mentality that we're not quick to point fingers at everybody else, but we just get the stuff out of our own eye, and then we can see clearly to remove the speck from our brother. So a lot of what we try to do, and and I, I know you know this just as well as I do, it's not about criticizing, it's not about putting people down or saying you're worthless because you're doing this and this. These are all things I used to do, <laughs> right? But I got I got the beam out of my own eye. I live I live that type of life and you know, help me. Let me help you get that speck out of yours, because that's that's what Christ wants us to do. And I think because we have uh, probably pushed too far on hyper grace, getting on one of my soapboxes, so that we're not dealing uh, with our own issues, that it really impairs us on spiritual warfare. We can't cry out for justice. We can't cry out for God to deliver us from unjust men. When you know, I, I may have this head theology of of the, some of the crazy stuff that they're preaching. But your spirit, man, knows. And and the minute you try to raise up in faith and everything, your spirit, man, goes, uh, 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 well, you can't do that. you got too much junk going on. Mm-hmm. And that's why the sanctification process is, is so important for believers. And that today is really being poo-pooed by the church. Yeah, it is. And I actually have a third book called Unifying the Body of Christ that I actually started writing like 30 years ago. Um, when I first got saved, the Lord said, write a book. And I laughed at him while I started writing it. And I basically wrote it my whole, through my master's, through my doctorate, and it just turned into a three book series. And sanctification was a, was a major part of that. This is the will of God, your sanctification. So it's not enough just to get saved, right? God wants to transform us into the image of Christ. And that is a process. Some of it goes quick, the more you let willing to let go of stuff. Um, Other stuffs are a little more embedded, you know, in our fallen nature, you know, stuff that might have been passed on from our parents. Um, But you can you can mature pretty quickly when you kind of got the roadmap before you, I think. And I I think we need that in our day because uh, we got a lot to do. There's a there's a prayer on the back of this first book that I I just love. And I'm going to I'm going to read that. I want you to comment on it. Vindicate us, Lord, and plead our case against the ungodly nation. 
Get justice for us from our adversary. Deliver us from deceitful and unjust men. Cause them to fall into the pit that they have dug for the righteous. Grant to your servants that we may speak your word in all boldness. Give us the nations for our inheritance and the ends of the earth for our possession. And that that's a strong prayer. Yeah, it certainly is. And and because every last word of it is scripture. I mean, it's uh, that's when I was praying for this nation, you know, Second Chronicles 714. I used to just pray that and recite that prayer over and over again. And the Lord showed me he's like, you know, that scripture right there is telling you to pray. It's not telling you what to pray. So I was like, okay, you know, what's the problem and how do we fix it? And that's when the Lord led me to Psalms 2. And that's where you're going to find quite a bit of that right there, that prayer. Because Psalms 2 basically says the kings of the earth and the judges have rebelled against God. And then it tells us what to do. We're, at, we're to ask of him, give us the nations as our inheritance and the ends of the earth as, as our possession. So um, it, it's something that is very, very timely today, because if you actually think about it, go to Acts chapter 4, when the apostles just got beaten by their government, what did they do? They went in the upper room and they prayed. And what did they pray? They prayed Psalms too, the same the same thing that we just said here. The kings of this earth have rebelled against you. And then they said, give us the boldness to go and preach. And then that's what they did for the next 17 years. You know, they came out of the upper room. They didn't stay up in their four walls. They came out of the upper room. And from Acts 4 to Acts chapter 17, which is about 17 years, they went from town to town, right to the gates of the city. And they de declared Christ to be king, that Christ outranks Caesar. So by the time they got to, I believe it was Thessalonica in uh, Acts 17, they said these men who have turned the world upside down have come here also, saying we don't have to obey the decrees of Caesar because there's a king that outranks him and his name is Jesus Christ. So unless we get back to that understanding again that, that we're supposed to be preaching the gospel of the kingdom, not just the gospel of salvation, and that is something that is never taught in the church today. No, it's not. That's kind of been... Uh, I think for both of us, that has really been our soapbox is, is getting back to preaching the kingdom, because if you don't, you get you get people running around with Willy Wonka golden tickets, and they're they're not in the kingdom. They don't act like the kingdom. They don't, uh, but they think they're going to get in, and it's just uh, I, I actually worry that we have produced a lot of people that think they're saved and they're not. Oh no, I agree. And then uh, I, I think that's very evident with the if we're salt and light in the earth and we're supposed to be the preservative uh, brother, we're failing. Yeah, yeah, we are. And, I, and that's why I always go to those scriptures that says, here's the evidence of your faith. You know, <laughs> that's what it is. Not just saying you have faith, you know, over in James, he says, you know, so you say you believe. So what? Even the demons believe, but faith without works is dead. So, I mean, you can you can really tell a believer just by looking at them because they're going to have the works that accompany that. One of the illustrations I gave in Sunday school not too long ago. So if I have two metal containers, right, and you can't see in them, but one of them has hot coals in them, the other does not. I don't need to be able to see in that container. I can go and put my hands on them <laughs> and one of them is going to burn me, right? So I don't need to be able to see what's in there, you know, to know one has the coals and one does not. And it's the same with faith and works. You know, people say well, they have faith. And I think that speaks on to what you just said there. A lot of people think they're saved, you know. Oh, I'm saved. You know, you know, where are your works? Boy, you say that to someone in the church today. Oh, we're not saved by works. And they go to Ephesians you know, 2, 8 and 2, 9, but they forget James altogether. So you got to be able to rectify Ephesians 2, 8 and 2, 9, what Paul said there. And then you got to rectify that with what James said over there that show me your faith, you know, without works and I'll show you my faith by my work. So we are not saved by faith, but a person that has true faith will have works. They'll have the works of righteousness. They'll be seeking to advance the kingdom of God. I mean, those are those are things that are evident in people's lives. And those are the people that I hit it off with right away, just like you and uh, you and uh, uh, Randy when we sat down there and ate. You know, one of the things and people also forget in, in 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul, basically what we do, we're building on the foundation of the Apostles and Prophets. And when he was writing that, he wasn't talking about John and, and Matthew. He was talking about Abraham and Moses. And again, you know, Jesus, of course, the, is the very foundation of what we have. But he said, listen, your, uh, your works are going to be judged by Christ. A Christian, we're going to go through a judgment. 
Because one of the things that the uh, that the feast of Israel teach us, or the feast of the Lord, is you never appear before the Lord empty-handed. Mm-hmm. And uh, in fact, we I just got a message that our my cohort and kingdom stuff is here. I just need to figure out a way to get him in here. There's that oh. handsome young man. We were sharing all the secret sauce of the kingdom before you jumped in here, Mike. <laughs> I don't hear him. Don't, don't, there's no mic on you. Looks like either he's on a wider view or he's got more books than you. <laughs> well, he's on a wider view. Oh, look at that. Yes, and oh boy. <laughs> okay, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, I can. You, you can hear me now. Yeah, and we'll okay. do some editing. That's that's OK. OK, uh, my apologies, guys. So sorry. No, we were talking about how the gospel of the kingdom is not being preached. And because of that, you have people that are ineffective in spiritual warfare. Uh, they, they have no position to do it. Uh, guys, one of the things that I'm doing, uh, I'm actually going through the book of Psalms and what I have found out is the Word of God is pretty interactive. You know, when uh, when the writer of Hebrews says that it was it's living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, he wasn't joking. Yeah, that's and right. It's, it's the questions that you ask. It's it's your mindset that you go into, that the Word of God begins speaking to you. And so I'm going through the Book of Psalms uh, with the view of it being the manual of the early church for spiritual warfare. Mm-hmm. Amen. And it was just like one of the things I've added daily in my prayers is I, I proclaim an utterance to the to the Devos crowd and all those. You better kiss up to Jesus now because he's angry and he's getting ready to come back. <laughs> that's well, that's Psalm two. That's exactly yep. right. Kiss the sun lest he be angry and you perish in your way. That's exactly the Psalm two and uh, the parable of the persistent widow in Luke 18. That's the whole, that would cover pretty much the appeal to heaven book. It's those two, two theological foundations uh, that is covered in there. Yes. And then, you know, when, when you get the junk out, you know, I've learned when you, when you look at the, uh, the feast of years ago, I read a, a really good article by Ariel Berkowitz on that. There's a sanctification process in the feast of the Lord. You know, in the in the in the spring, you make sure everything's under the blood. In the fall, you, you during the ten days of all, you make sure that you're right with God and man that you have done uh, the forty days. One of the things that Israel does forty days uh, before uh, before the uh, Day of Atonement is called Teshuvah. That they they seek the face of God, and it was actually what they were doing uh, when uh, when Moses came down the second time. He ended up coming down on the Day of Atonement. And so they uh, they they make sure that uh, the, you know the first time they were messing with the golden calf, and the second time they were making sure they were repenting and getting right with God, and, and they still do it to this day. And I think that's a prophetic imagery for us. Uh, Forty is the number you know of, of maturity and a lot of different things. It has a lot of very biblical significance. And the remnant church is going to be a church that is quick to repent. Uh, quick to make sure everything in their life is under the blood, and they're going to be quick to uh, uh, to ask God to judge things, and and for you know for the divine judgment to be established in areas, and uh, the, that that goes so against the grain of the modern church, it's unbelievable. Mm-hmm. That is a fact. That is a fact. Yep, they want that. They want that easy believe in ism. You know, they just want to believe something and okay, I'm good. And don't ask me to do anything. Don't ask me to change anything. Don't ask me to give anything up. Don't ask me to go through any challenges or sacrifices or hard times or you know. It's just it's the easy gospel and it's the Joel Steens out there making millions of dollars. Well. You know, we're trying to lead people closer and closer to the cross, which means dying to self. <laughs> and, you know, those churches aren't as full as the Joel Olstein churches are. Yeah, and if you insist I do these things, I'll go to a church that doesn't uh, that doesn't require that. You know, my my attitude is let the door don't let the door hit you. Exactly right. That's a breath of fresh air, brother Mike. Because <laughs> boy, we've been through the whirlwind here since in the last. Last year, since I had to make a tough decision, and uh, so yeah, 
true story, and I, I won't elaborate on this. I'll do so personally and privately, but not on this recording. Well, you know, I, I, tend, I tend to be apostolic. You know, this this is the line. If you can't meet the line, just get out of my way because you're messing with me in the kingdom. You know, a pastor will go out there and lay in front of their, and behind their car and say, please don't leave. The church will never be the same again. I'm thinking, yeah, it won't be messed up and full of bickering and arguing and everything like it has been for the last six years, you know. Uh, man, you're, you're, you're reading my mail. <laughs> 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 well, that's that's how I started my show, reading right out of Book of Acts, where it's where the Apostle Paul was talking to the in uh, the church at Ephesus to the elders, and he said, "Hey, as soon as I leave, remember I warned you. As soon as I leave, wolves are going to come in from the outside, and people are going to rise up from among you and try to draw disciples after themselves." And I'm just like, you know what? We've lost that kind of apostolic kind of anointing that's fine cut them away we don't need you here what <laughs> you know but you know when people are just worried about butts in the seats and money in the plate that's why they're throwing themselves behind the car because they don't want anybody to leave rather than uh preaching the whole counsel of god's word is where he really started that whole discourse off at well yes. sometimes the first step to revival is is through subtraction it is it is yeah, boy, I, I, I could offer up some commentary, my brothers, um, <laughs> but I'll, and, uh, I'll and just to, uh, give a hearty amen. Uh, to push Mike's se uh, the John's second book, uh, part of the problem is that Marxism infiltrated our seminaries and infiltrated the churches in 1920. Yep. yep. And so yep. a lot of the what we would call gatekeepers to Christian television, uh, gatekeepers to different uh, positions in the body of Christ. They're, they're kind of become the kingmakers. Uh, all have Marxist backgrounds. Yep. And they yes. they have torn, they have removed the foundations in the church. And we, we have lost our moral, our moral uh, foundations completely. Uh, brothers, I've, I've had men try to tell me that the uh, the cross changed sin and sin is no longer sin anymore. Yeah. Oh, I've heard that. I've heard that. Wow. Wow. And, uh, my response is I kind of turned my head sideways and I said, you're so stuck on stupid, it's ridiculous. <laughs> uh, <laughs> True story Jesus, there. Jesus, yeah, you've seen me at a conference, I'm sure, Mike. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Jesus said yep. me free of the power of sin. Sin is still sin. Uh, one of the very last books written in the in the New Testament was First John, very potent book. Uh, he it's the only book that actually mentions the term Antichrist, and he wrote it after he penned the book of Revelation. And I can I can see the Apostle John saying, "I vey, this you know, bad stuff is coming. How am I going to get the church through this?" And so he pens First John. You know, this is the spirit of Antichrist. This is the spirit of Christ. This is the spirit of error. This is the spirit of truth. Mm -hmm. And if you keep your life free from sin, the wicked one touches you not. Amen. And Amen. Today you, you follow Jesus and you're sinning like crazy. You're a fat liar. That's what the Apostle John said. And that's exactly right. Hallelujah. Hallelujah for the instruction, for the reminder. Yes. Amen, brothers. Amen. Yep, yep. And and when I do the discipleship, that's what I tell people. I say there's three books that were written to spiritual children: one Corinthians, uh, one John, and Hebrews. Those were all Christianity 101, and they all basically had the same message. So, go to go to uh, First Corinthians 15. I think it's. Uh, it's late in the chapter, but it says, awake to righteousness and do not sin, for some do not have the knowledge of God. I say this to your shame. He was like, guys, it's a shame that you haven't even figured out that God doesn't want you to sin. <laughs> so that was the kind of carnal church he was dealing with there in 1 Corinthians, but he says the same thing in John, and then in Hebrews, you know, what does he say? Don't make the same mistakes that the children of Israel made. The first four chapters are basically like, guys, let's not do the same thing they did, or we're going to take a, partake of the same judgment. But that you that's know. so anti-theological today. It's like, oh, no, God's totally different than he was in the Old Testament. No, we're yeah. just, uh, there's this two sides to God, the first coming of Jesus and the second coming of Jesus. And you're, you're I mean, when he comes back, he's all out of bubble gum, brothers. 
Uh, <laughs> but, you know, we, we forget the Apostle Paul wrote to 1 Corinthians, and th this is so powerful for us because in the days ahead, if God cannot walk among you, you're roadkill. In the days mm -hmm. ahead, if, if things don't change, it is God, either God is in the camp or you have no chance of surviving. And the Apostle Paul said, listen, touch not the unclean. Now, in the King James, it says, they add saying it's in italics, which means they were trying to figure out what he was saying because they didn't understand. Everything in the Old Testament that God said is unclean better not be in your camp, because if it's in your camp, he will not be. Yeah, oh, man. That's good. Well, they don't read the Old Testament. Well, here, here's one of the things, because I had a lady say this once, I mean, back when it, when I first got saved, we were in a Sunday school class, and she's like, God ain't the same as he used to be in the Old Testament. And I'm like, if God seems like he's a different type of God, it means somebody's got your theology all messed up. I said, babe, if you go read through the Old Testament, and then act like the New Testament doesn't even exist and jump right to the book of Revelation. I mean, so you read through the Old Testament and what God put up with and what he didn't put up with. And then if you transition right into the book of Revelation, you would think that was really just consistent. It's like he hasn't missed a beat. But because your theology is so messed up, you know, you think God has turned into this big cushy teddy bear that really doesn't care what you do or how you live. And I said, that is not even Christianity. I, I don't know where you're getting that. Well, I do, because you're getting it from the Joel Steens that only want to preach about six scripture verses, and they're all the same, mushy, mushy, God loves you, doesn't care how you live, put money in my plate type of messages. Yeah, I call that the Malibu Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Malibu Jesus. I love yeah. it. Mary oh, Mac wow. has, become, has become Bikini Barbie. <laughs> <laughs> But oh we're, we're and, and really, you know, when you look at all this, it but this is directly the influence what Marxists do and what they've had to do is and it, it's we Jesus warned us about it in in uh, Revelation chapter two. It's the doctrine of Balaam. You get God's people to sin and God will judge them. You don't have to curse them. God will take care of them if you if you take away the moral foundations. Yep. And then so they they have rendered the church basically culturally irrelevant until we have a revival and we return back to the word of God. Yeah, uh, yep. you know, I'm yep. preparing for the Hear the Watchman conference and my uh, uh, my message is entitled It Ain't Working. <laughs> Amen. Yeah, what Amen. we're doing isn't working because we're producing all the wrong kinds of uh, well, they're, they're, they may be critters, but they're not kingdom critters. Okay. I don't know what they are. No, you got, you got one camp brothers in, in the, in the remnant, you got one camp that's looking to Washington DC for solutions. And then, and, and then you got another part of the remnant that says, well, it's hopeless. Let's just, let's just circle the wagons and, and cover ourselves and just wait it out. And then, and then you got this other camp that says, no, let's let's fight back and let's do this. That. And it's like, well, listen, guys, here's the answer. Here's the solution to, to the problem. All three of these camps are pointing at the solution is repent, mm -hmm. repent and get your house cleaned up. Get your get your act together before God. The very things you've been talking about. That's the message that will unify the body. In, in these times in which we live. And if we'll do that, if we'll come together with on the same note, same message, same purpose of, of one accord, I think God will respond in a powerful way through us and we'll see changed lives. But that, that if we don't do that, if we don't fall on our faces before him, clean out all the leaven, uh, what, what do you use? You use the word all the time, Mike, um, the pablum of Babylon. I think that's is that is that the word? Yes. Yeah. You you, you I it I smile every time I, I read something where you've used that because it's like that is that is such a it's a word that grabs your attention immediately. And most people that don't know what that is are gonna say, Well, what is that? It's like well, here's what it is. And it's and it's all throughout the church, the the ecclesia, and and we need to do a house cleaning party. And that goes back to what we were talking about very early on. Sometimes that means people got to go. Yeah, they got to go. And I, I think that um, 
the the next American Revolution is going to have to be the same as the first. It's going to have to be born on the top of a great revival. Amen. Uh, well, Amen. There, and in fact, when I look at the Constitution, I, uh, guys, this is the first time in my life I felt like I needed to preach and teach the Constitution because nobody's getting it. Right. Okay. Yeah. But the the original Constitution, uh, the first few amendments are, are brilliant beyond compare. Now they get, I think later on they get kind of stupid. Okay. Some of them, especially like uh, taking uh, taking away, you know, it used to be I can't remember if it was the Senate or the House that was answerable to your state legislatures and they appointed them because they had checks and balances. They removed part of that and knocked it out of culture. Uh, and so there's there's some amendments that are really kind of stupid that later on came because they didn't appreciate it. And I think it was the effects of progressivism beginning to take hold in America even way back then. But they understood the separation of powers. When yeah. they, with the, when the, no one man should have all the power, so we're gonna have the legislative, the judicial, and the executive branch. The second, or the first and second amendment are also about keeping powers out of the control of the government. Free press, free speech, the church is a power. Second amendment, there's also power on the end of a gun. All of those were powers that they wanted to make sure that there were checks and balances. And the church has forgotten that if I'm on fire for God and I'm walking with God the way that I need to be, I am a power that even the government must recognize. The early founding fathers recognized it and said, don't make it about politics, make it about the kingdom. Amen. Amen. That's right. Because when we're right with God and we begin crying out for divine justice, it absolutely will terrify Washington, D.C. That's right. That's right. To, to, to your point, Mike, I just had it laying down here at, on the floor. My, my, well, you, you've been here, so you know my office. It's kind of a smaller office, but I've got books every place. And, and, and I know you, and I know you, Dr. John. You've got, you've got a pile of books you need to read. Well, I just got this one in the mail. It was recommended uh, by someone I was reading. And so I got this in the mail. And this, this is to your point. Uh, Dr. Mike, fire fall, how God has shaped history through revival. Yes. How God has shaped history, and that's the correct order. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when we get ourselves prepared, heart, mind, soul, spirit, when we get ourselves prepared here on the ground, when the ground is charged, mm -hmm. that fire will fall. Mm -hmm. The it's ground's got to be charged first. That's our job. What did Elijah do? He set everything in order. That's right. He set it all in order. And once it was in order, then he could pray. Yep. And uh, we, we've lost the instruction manual for the order. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Oh, yep. Christ. Well, and it's, you know what? We got so many things today coming at us, and this is part of the strategy of the evil one. It is. We got so many things coming at us that that our minds get a little bit scattered, if, if it, that's a good word. We have so many things we're trying to deal with, and and the enemy will use that division of our focus. He'll, he'll use that to creep in there sometimes and just sow some seeds. and And he isn't really interested in 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 immediate growth. He's he's sowing for the future. He's right. he's looking for that further opening when he can fertilize that thing, and then it becomes the thing that he wants it to be. We got to be very very careful, brothers, that we we maintain a, a correct perspective and in, 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 in an understanding, and not get our eyes off of the promises and 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 the things that God's already done, the things we know because He's spoken to us that He wants to do. And not start looking at our circumstances because those circumstances, man, they'll drag you down if you let them. You know, there's there's some seeds. I'm not a horticulturist, but I've I've read enough that there are seeds that sometimes once you put them in the ground, they don't sprout for ten years. Wow, there you have it. Just laying there in wait, and yep. and the end. What I have found out about the enemy, and and there's a there's a reason why some people's uh, youth as kids and stuff was absolutely hellacious is I think that he saw what they could be through Christ and was planting seeds to sabotage what they could be in their younger years. You know? Amen. I agree with that. 
Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's the thing. The enemy's got a long range game. <laughs> we Christians, we we don't think in those terms very often. We look for the immediate impact, and if we don't see the fruit, it's like, hey, just be patient. Keep your shoulder to the plow, and <laughs> and don't get impatient. God's working. Just listen to him. Yeah, I said that this morning to somebody. I said we, I said the church plays checkers while the devil's playing chess. You know, he's four or five steps ahead of us, and that's why Jesus said the children of the world are more shrewd than the children of the kingdom. You know, we we don't think things through. We don't pray things. We're not thinking three, four, five steps ahead. You know, I mean, you're military. I mean, I'm military. You know, you understand that. Hey, you do this, they're going to respond by this, and then we got to counter by this. No, we don't do that in Christianity. We just telegraph our move. Hey, here's what we're going to do. And they are, they're already three steps ahead of us, and that's why we're losing so bad. Yeah. I had a, had a mentor uh, years ago, a good friend, Dr. Doyle Varvel, and he said, there's a lot of prayers. I don't pray out loud until it's time for them to come to pass. Because hmm. hmm. I, I don't want to give the devil any information that is coming. There you go. Yeah. Yeah, there's there's power in 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 the in the word of God and in, in in singing it and praising it and proclaiming it and in, in reading the scriptures and praying the scriptures out. There's certainly power in that, but you're right. Um, some things you need to just keep close to the vest between you and the Lord, and um, when the time is right, <laughs> let her rip. <laughs> you know, I kind of wonder, if, like with the center that we're we're in the process of building. Yeah, you know, I share how I did not want to do it, you know, because, yeah. you know, you always you always have to you got to cast the vision. You got to get the vision statement out and everything else. And so if you if you do that and you do you telegraph that enough ahead of time, the enemy says, well, I better get to doing something to stop him from doing it. Right. Yeah. And and so this stuff is falling together before I even wanted to do it or realize that there was a vision with it because it. It was kind of like it was done in secret, and God says, okay, now that you've been obedient, I'm going to share with you what the heck you're doing, you know. Well, I know your testimony on that, Mike. I I, I know how that came about. I know Mary wrote down the phone number, and you wadded it up and threw it out the window. Uh, <laughs> I know you said, no, I'm not doing that. I don't even want to look at it. Um, and and so that compl- that was a curveball for the enemy because it's he ain't gonna do not with this. <laughs> and God God came in there and said, "No, I want you to go look." And then yeah. when you looked, he said, "Now I want you to buy it." We were so jaundiced <laughs> that if there was any reason that we could have found a way to say no, we would have said no that day. Yep. Simply because of the magnitude of what was going to have to be done. Yeah. And. and and I've been there, Dr. John. It, it is it is a, a remarkable place. A, a ton of work's been done already. And I, I've i stood on that platform overlooking what, what's going to be the meeting house, the meeting room. And I'm telling you what, I, I got chills because I, I, I sense that God is going to unleash his power there. Amen. He's going to he's going to equip men and women. For their assignments there, there's there's a lot of assignments that need to be fulfilled but people don't have the power to do it and and frankly they're not looking for it right god's going to do a work there brother mike i'm convinced of it yeah i think part of our slogan is let's not do it the easy way let's do it the right way <laughs> there yes. you go <laughs> yeah that's exactly right and I, well, I think- you already talked about Mike, have you already talked about what John's doing on uh, on Brideon and all that? Oh, we've not got to that. We kind of covered a little bit about his first book. And see, I can I can I can I can promote it because that's my job as the host. You know. <laughs> uh, and his second one, this one just came out, fighting the next American Revolution. And there's of course the Soviet flag on the top of the White House, which probably isn't too far from the truth right now. Uh, but guys, what I'm seeing, and see if you guys agree with this, is I see the Democratic Party is basically managing this the dismantling of America. Oh yeah, because yes. there, there's not enough uh, of um, bad ideas and and lack of skill available on planet Earth to include everything that you're doing. Yes. Yeah. It, that's, that it's a plan. Well, and listen, you cannot be 
consistently, grievously wrong this many times, unless it's intentional. Right. <laughs> this is no accident. I, I think they've actually broke the laws of physics because they're hitting about 150% right now. Uh, Some of them are exactly. so bad, you count them twice. <laughs> yep, that's exactly right. And, uh, and it just shows you how deep uh, and disturbing uh, progressivism has become. We know why, brothers, because it's satanic. Its its core is demonic. Yep. But it just shows you because you've got otherwise seemingly uh, rational people that are supporting what's coming out of of the cesspool that is DC, and and that tells you the fight that we have on our hands because the deception is deep on on millions of Americans. I think part of it, and this, this is going to kind of be my mantra, it's not about getting uh, uh, bodies in, 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 in the pews. It's got to be about winning the hearts and the minds. Exactly. Getting, actually walking in the kingdom. Well, we've already reached the point, brothers. John, you've been to our fellowship, so, so you know we've got a very small building. We've got a very small fellowship. We've reached the point now where our online congregation, our radio congregation is larger uh, by – by a bit than than the number of people that actually show up on our on our uh, days of gatherings. That's where we're at. Yeah, well, I, I I think the number of genuine Christians in the world are very very rare. I mean, you can't go into the city probably and find 50 of them. So to think you're going to find fi- you think you're going to find 50 people in Lima who are who are on fire for Christ, you know, the rest of them are just going through their traditions and everything else. So that's why I, I love the radio. I love Brideon. I love the online stuff because now, you know, okay, there's 500 of us out there, but you know, we're just not locally <laughs> in the same area. So, I mean, uh, I mean, everybody on Brideon has got really the, kind of the same message. All of us that, you know, go to each other's conferences, we got all the same message, but the way I see it, to be honest with you, if you think about the old Testament, the Levites were not given any land. They weren't given, the tribe was not given property. And that's because God wanted them to spread out. I would much rather have a church in a city with you there, Pastor, and with you, Brother Mike. I mean, I'd rather, and Coach Dave, but I'd rather I just have one congregation full of all of us. But I think God's got us spread out all over the country like the Levites, just so the word of God is getting you know, into all these, so we don't have one little tribe and everybody else forgetting about God. Yeah, I, I think we're a net that he's casting. I, I am surprised with the rim that show up. And believe believe it or not, I'm finding out a lot of them got sick with the institutionalized church a long time ago. Oh, yeah. And uh, if if, the, if all the remnant would show up this weekend looking for a church body to be at, there would not be enough church buildings to hold them in any nation. I there believe that. There are that many. Yeah, I believe that. And uh, although I think we're kind of separate, I think no, the number one thing that I hear the most is I, I feel alone out here. Well, you're not alone. Uh, there are there are more of us all around the world that hunger for God, that are thirsting after righteousness, yep. that want to see God move. There are more of us than there are those that call themselves Christians that go to church every week. Yep. And, and God has us where we're supposed to be, every single one of us. Because we we need to become influencers wherever we are. Yes. Yep. Yep. And 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 just to back that up, Mike and and John, um, push, you have to be careful when you cite statistics. Having having given that uh, qualifier, the most recent, uh, and in fact, I just I just participated in another Pew Research uh, survey that ask um, uh, media questions and um, but anyway the most recent Barna um, to support your statement Mike that that the remnant is 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 alive it's thriving it's it's growing people people are 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 getting rid of all this churchianity the spirit of religiosity that is that has fallen on them and, and really just quenched the work the manifestation of the spirit in their lives. Christians who, who people who profess faith in Christ say they're Christians, but they don't believe that the Bible is the word of God. 
it's 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 now a majority it's it's over it's it's approaching 60 percent i think if the figure's right if i'm remembering right 60 percent do not believe that the the bible is the word of god um over a majority so over 50 percent now think that there isn't anything wrong with with a sexual depravity um in, including all of the the outliers like uh unions and because I refuse to call it marriage, um, they don't see anything wrong with viewing the, the, the numbers. Now, uh, here's a startling one: the numbers among those who profess faith in Christ, as opposed to the those who profess no faith in any religion, are virtually the same in those who participate in viewing pornography and think it's okay. Mm-hmm. So, that's just a little glimpse into into. What is going on in "quote unquote" Christendom today in America? It's a train wreck. It's it's a it's a whitewashed tomb. It's a sepulcher full of rotten dead bones. Yep. And it's time. I just pray God throw off this shell that 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 America thinks represents you because it doesn't, and reveal your true remnant believers to to America and let's get them saved. Exactly. Yeah. Me and Coach Dave Dobbermeyer was driving back from Alan Keyes' studio once and um, and not too long ago, a year or so ago. And, and I said, you know, we're, we're about ready for another reformation because if you remember the first coming of Christ, everything was broken. The temple worship was broken, the money changers, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, everybody. The entire system was broken. There was nothing that was not broken. And I yeah. said, that's where we're at today. The entire Christianity, what we call Christianity today, is flat out broken. And that's why Jesus had to go out <laughs> out of the synagogues and out of the temple and go out into the fields. And, you know, and he had yep. to get the, the pimps and the prostitutes and the pushers and had to get them and lead them to Christ. Because all yep. everybody else was so stuck in their traditions and their ruts, they couldn't they couldn't see Christ when he came. Yep. Amen. That's exactly right. Exactly right. You know, I wondered, I've, and this is just something I've been pondering and, and putting together some of my stuff. Uh, I kind of wonder if we need to go back almost to the synagogal system that existed in Paul's day uh, instead of following after Constantine's model of having church. Yeah. Uh, I, because yes. If you, if you look at it, uh, and there, there, actually the rows for the men went like this, and there was a big aisle. For the rabbi to walk in after he taught, you know, 45 minutes to an hour, he may spend the next two and a half hour answering questions. Yes, and amen. Back and forth with the men and en- engaging them. Uh, we're not engaging the men. We're not. We're not. Uh, uh, we're not uh, requiring them to think at all. Yep. We we have emasculated the male. Yep. Uh, we've misinterpreted so many things that's in the New Testament, and. Uh, Guys, if we don't end up with some to, some type of mechanism that digs deep and have ministers that know the word enough to say, you know, I don't know, let's let's spend the next 45 minutes digging in the word, pull out your laptops. We're getting ready to pull out your Bible software and we're going to do some digging uh, yes. so that we as as a as a group can begin trying to find the mind of the Lord on this because the question you asked, I have never been asked before in my life, and I'd like to know the answer. Let's let's yep. dig together. Yep. Well, we're talking about the the real, the 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 construction, the maintenance, and the expansion of the ecclesia. That's yep. that's what we're talking about here. Yep. And and that was the original model, but we got away from that, right? You know, the first yeshiva that I was ever a part of and these these folks had uh basically built on there was a a building separate from their house but you could probably see 50 60 70 people in there and they had tables set up and everything and and uh dr coke uh, basically gave out a basic theme and they all went to they all went to work and discussing it back and forth the teenagers were engaged they had uh, all kinds of reference materials uh all on the sides of the walls and so you could get up and you could pull down lexicons, commentaries as you were digging into it. And this thing went all day long. They they stopped for lunch and they kept on going. It got about dinner time. Some of the adults said, you know, I, I think we may have to quit. And guys, it was the teenagers that, that really, oh, do we have to quit? You know, 
Beautiful. Uh, surely, you know, the, the sun's going down. We could order pizza, you know, because <laughs> it was it was a Sabbath fellowship. You know, we could we could have somebody deliver pizza. We could keep on going for another two or three hours. The yep. teenagers. But they, that's, they, that's were, they were more profi- proficient in using Greek and Hebrew lexicons than most ministers I know. Oh, yeah. Wow. Beautiful. That somehow or another, we need to bring that back into the church. Yes. So when are you going to do one, Mike? I'm probably I'm probably going to end up doing one whenever we get this building done. Uh, Beautiful. Beautiful. And, uh, I think one of the things I'm going to do, even I may even do this and then throw them off down and hear the watchman. I get 90 minutes. I may preach for about 60 minutes and then take 30 minutes of questions and answers. Oh, yeah, that's that's great. Yeah, that's fantastic. I like that. Yeah, and I know, uh, I think Scott Lively's doing something like that. Last time we were in a conference together, he was talking about some of the stuff that he was doing. And I remember when I when I first started ministering to people, we'd go over to go over to their house, co-worker of mine, and I mean, his mom and dad, her mom and dad, and sisters, and everybody came together, and we just spent the entire night there just studying God's Word and eating and fellowshipping, and it was very casual, and questions were being asked. I mean, I'm pretty sure that was the more of the model of the early church than this real rigid, come in, sit down, listen to somebody else, you know, some guy in skinny jeans, you know, give a Christian concert for <laughs> an hour and a half, and then go home, and then... You know, it's it's it was more relational. It was more about you know iron sharpening iron rather than just sitting there and listening to some guy spout off for forty five minutes. I know as I as I work on this practical theology, which is the project after next, I'm going to be teaching it there at the center, uh, at a conference table. I'm I've already got the the parabolic mic picked out that can set in the middle of the table, so that after I do my forty five minutes, uh, we may do an hour discussion, but I want to record all the comments. Love it. Uh, on the audio so that the, the questions, the interaction, all of that is captured and becomes a part of the teaching series. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Yeah, that'd be because fantastic. I have found, I have seen people, guys, let's say they were safe six months ago, but they are so hungry. Mm-hmm. And they're asking deep questions that uh, I've even seen some some older saints, are scared, you know, they're, they're afraid to ask and then you know, the young ones aren't. That's right. They'll yeah. go and say, why are we doing this this way if it doesn't work? That's a good question, Jimmy. We'll bring that up at, at next year's annual meeting, and hopefully <laughs> by then you'll forget. You know? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, well, the, I mean, the older ones, the ones that have been sitting in church for 30 years, you know, they, they don't want to. They don't know the answer, but they don't want to ask because, you know, I'm an elder. I, you know, I don't want to look like I don't know something. There's no there's no humility that, you know, there's no teachable spirit there. So that's why you run into that, you know, rigid type of Phariseeism. Well, I think this will help bypass uh, some of the things that are going on. When I was on the Alan Key show, John, that you set me up on, and I really, the, bro- the brother that was filling in for him, him and I really connected. And one of the things that came out of that conversation, he said, even with ministers, if you challenge their theological soundbite, uh, they respond with anger. They do. Absolutely. And and that's because they don't have an answer. And they, they don't even understand the depth of what they just, of, of whatever they just said that really sounded good. You know, it, it, it may have been that good fortune cookie on the outside, but on the inside, <laughs> there, there's not even a fortune, man. There's just an empty shell. Yeah. Yep. Yep. True story. I've experienced that many, many, many times over the years, brothers. Many times. So, John, how do we move from how do we move from here? What are you What are you promoting in your books? Ah, uh, well, it depends on which ones. The the two uh, the next fighting the next American Revolution. I actually wrote in 2006, um, warning where we were headed. We were headed towards Marxism because now I just got out of the Air Force and I was trained during the Cold War, so I knew what communism in other countries looked like. Apparently, people couldn't see it here when it was right here in their face. So I tried to warn everybody for a long time, and then I just let the book die off. And me and Brother Mike were out at a conference in Missouri, and he said he just read his book. He said, man, you need to get this thing back out there. So we so we relaunched it. Um, but, I mean, that'll, that'll take us back to what the Founding Fathers entailed. Um, and then the Appeal to Heaven is really how we get there. It's really a book on a, a imprecatory prayer imprecatory psalms you know calling god in lord get them 
break the teeth of the wicked, break the armor of the evildoer, you know, because there's a lot of wicked people out there in this world and they're harming the innocent. Well, it's starting in the womb, <laughs> right up until, you know, right up until the elderly. I mean, they don't care. They they will feast on anything and anybody, you know, and like uh, Pastor Mike says, I mean, these are Luciferians. These are not, you know, just people who are misguided. These these are people that, that have rejected the truth. And that, um, I thought of that earlier in the show when we were talking about Second Thessalonians, when it, when it talks about the, the man of sin and the Antichrist coming on and it says God will send a strong delusion because they had not a love for the truth. I think there's enough truth out there right now that people are actually polarizing into camps. And I tell people, you better be very, very careful when you reject truth because you're going to get to the, it's like a check valve. You're going to get to the point of no return, just like Pharaoh did. And, and, and you're going to think you're doing right and you're not doing right. So I think that's what we're going to see manifesting itself here in the coming years. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think the precatory prayers is so important because uh, the police can't do it all. Uh, and, and the court systems are rigged. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times we have, we have a lot of good police officers that have their hands tied. And so it yeah. is, it's going to take the judgment of God. And I tell you what, when the judgment of God starts falling, it will get the elite's attention. Amen. Yeah, it, it will. Yes. It will. And that's what it says in Revelation. I think it's when the sixth seal is open and it says the sky will recede. And it says, and look at all the people it says. It's really the deep state, the kings and the princes and the great men and the rich men. That's the deep state. And it's going, to be, it's going to be so apparent that they say, hide us from the wrath of the Lamb, <laughs> for the time of his judgment has come. So, um, yeah, it's coming, and everybody's going to recognize it. Amen. And the exciting part is we get to be a part of that. If, if, we, if we get our lives right and learn how to walk in the kingdom the way that we're supposed right. to, that it's, it's us going before the court of God. Yes. And, and pleading with the Father, now is the time. To, to judge these things and rid these things from the earth. Mm-hmm. Amen. Amen. And the picture I get, brothers, is this. We have standing there. Yes, we do. We have standing there. Our enemies do not. Correct. Why aren't we taking advantage of that? Yep, that's exactly right. What the, what's the saints under the stairs say? I think the cry of the martyrs, how long, O Lord, faithful and true, till you judge those on the earth who shed our blood? And he's like, sit yeah. tight a minute. I'll get to them in a minute. So, mm-hmm. you know, oh, you say that right. today in a modern church. Oh, that's not very Christian that you ask God to, you know, avenge us and get our blood. And so, yeah, the, the church's mindset is just so broken. It's not funny. That's why my show is called America Unhinged, because we're so unhinged from reality which is the word of God and the truth in, that's found in scriptures. And even the church is so broken, it ain't funny. That's also called the evening news, by the way. But that's There you little, go. There that's you go. why there's bright tea on TV and, and, <laughs> and different things to actually now a word from reality. <laughs> <laughs> there there right. you go. That's awesome. <laughs> Yeah, that's exactly right. Amen. Well, God's raising up so many people. I mean, you guys have got your platforms. I'm I'm doing Gatekeepers Week this week. I got Jeff Dornick and all his hosts on this week. So awesome. I'm trying to ju- I'm just trying to promote as many people out there that got these independent platforms. Um, of course, Brighton's got like 30 hosts, and we're in 18 countries. But you know, there's a lot of people that have been doing this for a while, and those are the people we're trying to pull together and not you know, hey, watch my show or watch my program. But hey. Dr. Mike's got a great show. You know, Dr. Lake's got a Mike show. Look at the gatekeepers. They got they got 12 good, you know, podcasters on there. And these people are sincere followers of the kingdom, and that's why I'm promoting them. Amen. Amen. Yeah. John, John while we have you on here, give us how how do we, how do people connect with you? Uh, you're on Bright on TV with it's called America Unhinged. Is that uh, a morning show five times a week or how how is your show laid out? Yep, you can go to brighteon.tv, and uh, every one of the hosts really live streams uh, right there. Uh, 9 o'clock to 10 o'clock Eastern time is when my show is, and it's also just got picked up on Conservative Television of America, which is another brand-new startup um, that they're going to hope to have affiliates in a bunch of different cities, and um, it's going to be a good work. But, yeah, they, they can't contain it. This is what I tell everybody. They want you to play in their sandbox and play by their rules. Well, guess what? They're kicking so many people out of their sandbox. 
we're just starting to build our own sandboxes now where we're not bound by their rules anymore. And they're going to find out they're sitting there holding their little shovel and their little pail, and there's nobody else to play with or control because we're all going to be over here leading like we should have been doing to begin with. That's right. Yeah, why, same thing. why do we want to mess with a sandbox when our daddy owns the beach? <laughs> there you go. Exactly right. Why do I want to be controlled by anybody but the Holy Spirit? That's been my message for about six months from now. You know, people ask me, what should I do? I'm not your Holy Spirit. E each and every one of us should be controlled by the Holy Spirit, period, end of discussion. And me and Brother Mike's talked about this quite a bit. Stay in your lane. Whatever, you, <laughs> whatever your you're lane. called to do, you just do that thing. God has somebody else to do another thing. God has somebody else to do another thing. And when we all do that, that's where we come together in unity. That's right. Amen. Brother Mike, something else you'd like to share for we uh a Amen. We no, it's I know we could fellowship until the cows come home. You know we that's could. That's a fact. <laughs> yep, that's a fact. Nope. The Lord is doing a thing. He's building the ecclesia. We we this it's expanding, it's growing. We don't need the world and the world so we don't need Babylon, friends. No, we, we gotta don't. get out of this mindset. Let's just break that mold, that thinking. God is doing a thing. Let's get on board with that. That's right. Well, gentlemen, thank you for being on today. And we're def John, we're definitely going to have you back on. And we may actually, may, I may want to try to do one of these live, at least audio down in Ohio. Okay, that'd be uh, great. Bring, bring some of my equipment and, and uh, three or four mics where we can sit down and do a round table. Yeah, no, that's perfect. I'd love to do fantastic. it. Yep, right, fantastic. God bless, guys. Thank you for being thank on. Thank you, brothers. Today. Thanks for having me. Stay informed. Tune in to weekly podcasts by Dr. Michael and Mary Lou Lake to keep you informed, inspired, and empowered in the kingdom of God. Tune in to www.kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. That's kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. This video was made possible by our partners worldwide. Please prayerfully consider supporting the ministry that is preparing the remnant for the unfolding of end times prophecy. Send your offerings to Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri. That's Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri, 65746-0160. You can also donate online at store.biblical-life.com. That's store.biblical-life.com.